I'm Ted Everingham. I'm speaking to you from the Alger House at the War Memorial on the shores of Lake St. Clair in Gross Point Farms, Michigan. Welcome to the American Democracy Series, a conversation with people of great interest to all of us, a chance for us to talk with them and listen to them. Let me ask you to mute yourselves now, as, as I did inadvertently, and uh, that'll make things a lot easier for all of us. Our guest tonight is Rochelle Riley. That's a name that's familiar to all of us in this area because she has relatively recently ended a nearly 20 year career as an award winning, winning Detroit newspaper columnist. That happened in 2019. Uh, she did that to become the city of Detroit's director of arts and culture. In that position, she now guides the city's investment in the creative economy and transformative innovation. In 2020, uh, Rochelle conceived and coordinated, I love this story, the United States' first citywide memorial to victims of COVID-19. 15 funeral processions circled the city's Belle Isle Park, past 924 photo billboards of victims. The installation gained international attention in August of 2020 and provided closure for families across the city who simply couldn't hold individual funerals. More than 25,000 cars drove past those photo billboards, millions viewed it online and on television, and it was featured during the national coverage of President Joe Biden's inauguration. Rochelle Riley, an essayist, keynote speaker, artist, remains, and these are her words, a writer by trade, a warrior by necessity. She's the author of the book we're going to talk about tonight called That They Lived, African Americans Who Changed the World. It was published by Wayne State University Press this year, or last year, 2021. It's available wherever books are sold. And if you'd like uh, some guidance about that, click on RochelleRiley.com. There'll be a list of places you can find the book. She's also written The Burden, African Americans and the Enduring Impact of Slavery. That was published by Wayne State University Press back in 2018. Rochelle travels the country hosting conversations about the burden that America still bears by refusing to deal with the aftermath of American enslavement. Rochelle is a 2016 inductee into the Michigan Journalism Hall of Fame, a 2019 inductee into the National, uh, pardon me, the Journalism Hall of Fame, uh, North Carolina Media and, Media and Journalism Hall of Fame. I butchered that. Uh, she's a graduate of North Carolina. She's also a 2021 inductee of the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame. And she is a co-author, uh, co-founder of Letters to Black Girls. I want to ask you more about that. Letters to Black Girls, which is an initiative to give letters of advice and encouragement from women across the country to girls across the country. Rochelle lives not too far away on the banks of the Detroit River, but she's a traveler who never stays home very long. She's visited 28 countries, 33 states, and is still counting. Welcome, Rochelle. Thank you so very much. I'm so thrilled to be here. I am so thrilled to meet some new people and see some new faces. I'm so glad to meet the Albion students and staff that are on board. And uh, I'm looking forward to a great uh, conversation as a part of the American Democracy Series. Let me, let me introduce and thank you for doing that. I want, to, want you to meet Holly, wave your hand, Holly Ballantyne class of 2024 at Albion College, uh, a member of the Ford Institute, the Gerald R. Ford Institute for Leadership and Public Policy and Service. Uh, she was recruited to be with us by Eddie Visco, whose name you'll see on the screen. Uh, Eddie is the Associate Director of the Ford Institute. And in the interest of full disclosure, I graduated from Albion College. So Rochelle, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I wanna start just to talk to you a little bit about how the book happened. So I wanna share um, that story, uh, which is uh, quite fascinating and not unusual for me. When I was working on The Burden, 
back in uh, 2017, uh, I was swamped. So I didn't have a lot of time to be on social media as, what, as often as I usually am. But I did every day in February of that year, see these beautiful photographs of this little girl embodying the spirit of these amazing iconic women. So one day there was Daisy Bates, you know, the Arkansas reporter who um, quite frankly was the confidant and, and supporter for the Little Rock Nine. And then I, another day saw Nikki Giovanni, one of my favorite poets. And I went, oh my God, look at this kid who actually really is becoming Nikki Giovanni. And then another day there was Maya Angelou who wrote history despite its wrenching pain cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And I thought, this is just the best thing I've ever seen. But as I said, I was on deadline with the burden. I didn't have time to do anything except enjoy them. Finished, the book came out. I started going around the country on the book tour. Well, in February of 2018, the photographs began again. And this time I said, I have to find out more. So I looked up, you know, I was a journalist. <laughs> I looked up uh, Christy Smith Jones and she, I found her in a little town outside of Seattle. And I said, please tell me about why you decided to do these photographs. And she said that her daughter, Lola, who was four at the time, came home and talked about studying black history and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And she was so proud and so excited. And she said she really needed to latch on to that and, and sort of, you know, strike while the iron was hot and, and teach her about other people that she should know. And she wanted to make sure she knew that there were women who were not only important, but who were instrumental in affecting the way we live. So she started doing that. And I said, well, I've got an idea. I think that we should do a project. I would love to write something to go with each of these photographs. Um, you know, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. I, I can do that. She said, oh no, oh, I could never do that. This is a woman who was one of the, just the best moms, wives and moms ever. She, she's a homemaker outside of Seattle. She took these photographs with her iPhone and she's very, very shy. As a matter of fact, I was not able to get her to participate in any of the book tour or conversations about the book. She said, the pictures speak for themselves. Thank you so much, go away. So, um, but, but I adore her. And so I said, well, I, I have to convince you to do this project. And she said, no. And uh, for people who know me, they know I'm pretty persistent. So I got on a plane and flew to Seattle and got in a car and drove to Kent. And uh, I asked for permission, I didn't just show up, but I took her family to lunch and I said, I, I really, really think this is something very important for all of our kids and I'd really like to do this. And with her mom's encouragement and her husband saying it would be okay, she, she finally relented. And so I, I got too excited and I said, oh my God, we're, we're gonna do it. And you know what, we can do a bunch of them. We can do one on musicians, we can do one on scientists, we can do one on sports stars. She said, I'm not doing any of that. And I said, well, you're only gonna do one book? And she said, yes. And I said, well, if you're only gonna do one book, we, we have to also include boys who grow up to be great men because we have Lola and her pictures already. Would you, would you take some pictures of a little boy? And she said, okay, I'll do that for the one book, but we have to find a little boy. Well, I happen to know a little boy. I flew to Dallas and got my grandson, Caleb. And she, over the course of four days, a four day weekend did with Caleb what she was able to do with Lola over the course of a month. And that became that they lived, African-Americans who changed the world. And this is my grandson, Caleb, uh, on the left of the screen, on this side of the screen, <laughs> he is W.E.B. Du Bois. On this side of the screen, he's Thurgood Marshall. And then in the center, of course, is Lola as Rosa Parks. And uh, I love the cover. I love the story. I love doing this. But the hard part was once she gave me the pictures that weekend of shooting, which, by the way, was not that bad, you know, between bribery and cupcakes and an occasional movie where Caleb wanted to go as Frederick Douglass. And I said, we, we can't do that, but you can go as Thurgood Marshall. Um, but I spent the next year doing the research to try and find out about all of these famous people as children, because the whole point of us doing this was to teach children and their parents and their teachers and everyone that every important person was once a child. So that was my job. And over the course of that time, I bought books and read, and you think you know everything and journalists always think they know everything. I learned so much that I didn't know about so many people. Shirley Chisholm, who was one of my heroes, and each essay begins the same way. Shirley Chisholm would grow up to be the first African-American woman elected to Congress and the first woman to campaign to be a major party nominee for president. 
But when Shirley Anita Hill was three years old, her family was so poor that her parents sent their three daughters to live in another country so she could get an education. This was Lola as, as uh, Shirley Chisholm. And it wasn't that Christy got the dress right and the earrings right and the glasses right and the necklace right and the wig right. It was when she told Lola the story of Shirley Chisholm, she squared her shoulders back and she's standing there with a sense of resolve and pride that literally epitomizes uh, Shirley Chisholm's motto of unbought and unbossed. I just love that picture. And it was the same with Duke Ellington. Edward Kennedy Duke Ellington would grow up to be one of the most celebrated musicians and composers in history. He's considered one of the founding fathers of American jazz. But when Edward was 15 years old, he was serving sodas at the counter at the Poodle Dog Cafe, writing his first composition, Soda Fountain Rag. And he did it before learning to read or write music. That's a true love of, of what you wanna do. And so when we told my grandson Caleb this story, and he sat at the piano. This is what we got. And we were trying so hard not to break the fourth wall and stay in character so we wouldn't, you know, upset, you know, have the kids not paying attention to what they were doing. But Christy and I couldn't help elbowing, going, look, look, look at him. Do you see it? Do you see it? And we did that same thing over and over. Aretha Franklin, who would grow up to become the queen of soul, an international R&B singing sensation, and the quiet civil rights leader who helped African-Americans gain equality. But when Aretha was 12 years old, she was pregnant. Now imagine if there's some young girl, and she doesn't have to be 12, but who finds herself in a position that thinks that she will never be able to have a life of her dreams. And quite frankly, Aretha Louise Franklin did. And this is Lola being not just posing as and not just taking a picture as, but being Aretha Louise Franklin. And so there were lots of these, Bessie Coleman and her story, Jackie Robinson, who I did not know until I started doing research for the book, was in a gang when he was 16 years old. Rosa Parks, Claudette Colvin, whose story is very important because even though Rosa Parks was the one whose name was ingrained into history for not giving up her seat on the bus, it was 15 year old Claudette Colvin who didn't give up her seat, whose name was on the lawsuit that changed segregated busing in Montgomery, Alabama. Frederick Douglass, as I said, this was Caleb's favorite. He wanted to walk around in that hair the whole weekend and he couldn't have it. And Fannie Lou Hamer, who is my favorite, when we celebrate suff not just suffrage, but making sure that women had the right to vote. 1920 is not when I celebrate. I celebrate in 1965. That's when my mom got the right to vote. And it's thanks to folks like Fannie Lou Hamer, who was beaten nearly to death for trying to register people to vote. Muhammad Ali, who I covered for a long time in Louisville, Kentucky. That's Caleb being arrogant. <laughs> and this one is Alice Parker. This little girl is not in the book, but we're gonna be doing a project and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, one of my best friends wanted to participate in sort of celebrating this and she's the head of an energy company. So she had her granddaughter Madison to dress as Alice Parker. Alice Parker was an African-American woman in New Jersey who could not stand being cold and the fireplace was not doing it. So in 1919, a year before uh, women's suffrage, she, <laughs> she invented central heat, the ductwork that would go in your house. And thanks to her, we all stay warm. So this is Madison as Alice Parker. And we're gonna be doing uh, this celebration of being an icon and ask parents and their teachers and other folks to have their children dress as these iconic African-Americans. And it's a part of this campaign I'm doing to celebrate black history all year and not just as posters in Black History Month. So we're gonna have information on my website and anyone interested in doing it where you can send those photos and they're gonna be a part of a gallery exhibit in Detroit. So that is how this all started. And that is why I'm so proud of the book and I would love to talk to those folks who have gathered here tonight about it, Ted. Thank you. Oh, well, it's you and I had the opportunity to talk for a few minutes before we joined the rest of the world. And one of the things that you emphasize, and I've read this book, I, I read the book over the past weekend. And it's a book, Rochelle says she writes things for people from nine to 90. And I can tell you that's the case. So that wasn't a challenge for you. Well, I was a newspaper columnist for over 20 years, um, almost all of that time in Detroit. And we were taught from journalism school that you, for newspaper readers, that you write to fifth graders, to, to people who read at a fifth grade level. But for me, I used to write my columns as if I was writing them for my grandmother and my daughter at the same time. 
and I had to make sure that I filled that gap. So I got used to doing that. Uh, that part was not as hard as other things that went into trying to make the book. I, I, I want people to know, no matter who you are, that you can be inspired by what these folks did, by what they meant, and by what you can be. Because the whole point of the book, again, was to teach every child, every adult, every person who cares, that every important person was once a child. How did you go about selecting the people to be featured in the book? Well, I can tell you half of it was done because, you know, as I said, I, <laughs> I had to convince Christy to do the book and we chose pictures that she already had done. But for Caleb's pictures, we had to choose people. And for me, it was, it was, it was, it was easy in some instances and harder in others. And there are people that, which is why I wanted to do an encyclopedia, that uh, did get left out. And if I do a second edition of it, I would add some. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I know, for instance, Muhammad Ali was not just a boxer. So that's why we chose him. Thurgood Marshall won more cases before the US Supreme Court than any other attorney, period, and became an associate justice and then chief justice on the Supreme Court. That was easy. Some of the other ones were a little harder. Barack Obama was included, of course, and um, Jackie Robinson because it wasn't just that he was a great baseball player. It wasn't just that he overcame the idea of gangs and being in a gang to become a letterman in three sports and change the face of baseball and the way Americans viewed each other. Um, but, but it was that he did it with such character and grace and changed the way that people uh, dealt with each other. So we tried to look for things like that, but I can tell you if, if somebody named five people who should have been in there, I would go, yep, and one of those would be Henrietta Lacks, who I've been writing about on Twitter all week, whose cells, uh, before she died of cancer, um, proved to be immortal, where, you know, cells, when you took them out of the body, they would just die, and hers didn't die. So they've been used hundreds of thousands of times for research for everything from the COVID-19 vaccine to polio vaccine. And her story needs to be told regularly. I wrote about her, oh my God, I guess 10 or 15 years ago when Rebecca Skloot wrote the book about her, the immortal cells of Henry Lacks. Um, but I, I started writing about her just because of an incident that brought her to mind. And there were all these people who came onto my Twitter feed saying they'd never heard of her, never heard of that story. And that's why it's so important for us to teach all of American history. Let me ask uh, Holly, do you have a question? Yes, I'm very interested. At the beginning of your story, you was talking about how you were writing a book, but you saw the pictures and it inspired you. I just want to know, like, what made you think of seeing like these pictures of this little girl essentially cosplaying and making something more out of that than just pictures, adding stories to it, should I say? That is an excellent question. And I can tell you it's because I'm a writer. Um, when I was a columnist, I used to tell people, oh, God, I met a great column today or somebody would tell me a story and I go, oh, I think I can make something out of that. Every time I see anything, I think about how to write about it. And in this instance, these were like really important iconic women who deserved it. So as a writer, the first thing I would think of is, okay, how can I tell something about their story that's different or um, that might be interesting for me to research? And it became about the kids. Excellent, excellent question, Holly, thank you. It, it, what I've got to ask this, I'm a, I'm a grandpa, okay? So when you went to Dallas and said, hey, Caleb, I got an idea, how did he react to this at age, what, 10 or 12 at the time? Well, he was actually eight, and the whole weekend was about bribery and cupcakes and <laughs> sort of state Fortnite. It's like, okay, we're going to shoot this picture, but then you get a cupcake and you get to play 20 minutes of Fortnite, then it's back into makeup for the next picture. So bribery works. Um, I, I think he truly got a sense of it once he was getting dressed for each of the pictures. You know, when, when I said, let's go to Seattle, he didn't care what we were going for. It's like, oh, Seattle, yeah, let's go, let's get on a plane. Because he, he loves planes and he does like to fly. But once we got there and, and he got a sense of what it was, he would go right into character. He would, you know, he became Martin Luther King and he became um, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and his, his picture on the cover, uh, when I showed you that a second ago, I, it still takes my breath away that he actually, you know, sort of not only understood that, but it meant something to him. And, and I, I think that one of the things that meant something to me is that these are names that he will know. Now, my favorite picture, literally, and I love them all, but him as W.E.B. Du Bois, because you know, the hooded eyes and the fact that he looked, you could tell he's so smart 
but so tired of people not understanding that he's smart. And him as Thurgood Marshall being like one of the greatest lawyers in the world, but still having to prove it. There's just this resolve in each of these characters that I, I just, I loved watching them embrace that. And Lola, oh my gosh, there, there were so many uh, of the pictures where she literally just nailed it. I mean, you knew that she knew. And even if she doesn't always think about this the same way um, as they get older, we know that they'll know these people as every child should. And I think that's so important. And I, I love the book. Um, and I, one of the things we, we talked about before we went public here was while each of these essays begins with a glimpse of the person as a child to show that they, they, they weren't born famous. So they weren't born, all, they overcame many things. And one of the things I really liked as I read the book, uh, and each of these essays is what, three or four pages long, right? Uh, each one ends with Jackie Robinson taught us, Thurgood, from Thurgood Marshall we learned, kind of emphasizing the lesson to be learned from that life. That, that was a battle that I won with the publisher, and not the <laughs> publisher, editor, um, because she loved the essays and she said, well, you know, it's almost like you're at the end of this perfect essay and then you're hitting home a point. I said, I don't know that everybody will get the point. I want to make sure they get the point. I, I want to bring that lesson out again. And it's okay to do that. And so I want, and that's why everyone ends with a lesson that, um, the, the, that the person learned or that we can learn from what they did. Well, I, I, think, I think it's, I, I'm glad you won that battle. I'm very glad you won that battle, Rochelle. Um, I want to mention to people who are watching and listening tonight, you're more than welcome to submit questions to Rochelle using the chat function of Zoom. Type out a question. Uh, our producer, Mike Montgomery, across the table from me is watching for those questions, uh, relaying them to me uh, so that we can pass them on to Rochelle. I'm sure you have lots to talk about. You mentioned Alice Parker and that you were going to tell us more about Alice. Well, that was the woman who um, my friend who runs an energy company chose for her granddaughter Madison to dress at because dressed as because who knew? I mean, I I had never heard of her. Uh, I was so inspired by that because here was yet one more person. I'm one of those folks who hates the idea of hidden figures. I know that some people like that, and they're so glad that these stories have been uncovered. But when the movie Hidden Figures was done, and Katherine Johnson in her 90s, almost 100 years old, got to see on, you know, on the screen what she did. All I thought about was, oh my God, Neil Armstrong would not have gone in space until this woman said so. And we don't know that story for decades after it happened. I, I want the figures to not be hidden. I want us to know these stories, just like we know, you know, Paul Revere riding a horse or, you know, I, 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 I revel in, in the newness of each one that I find out about. So the whole Alice Parker story, first of all, that she could get a patent for anything in 1919, but second, that there's something that affects how great I live now because of someone who was like me that long ago uh, was just moving. It is inspiring. Someone, one of our viewers has said, uh, which person in the book has inspired you the most, Rochelle? And how do you model or imitate their behavior in today's life? Well, I can tell you, it, that's a tough, tough choice because there would probably be three. As I mentioned, Fannie Lou Hamer is one of them because of the fight that she did to make sure that everybody could vote. But one of the other ones, because until you really think about it, you don't pay enough attention to it. I'm gonna read you a little bit of the one about Thurgood Marshall who would grow up to be an American lawyer who did more than any other person, not any other black person, more than any other person to make life equal for African-Americans. He argued more cases before the US Supreme Court than any lawyer in American history. And he became the first African-American to sit on the US Supreme Court. But that stellar journey began when Thurgood was 14 years old and his parents, William Canfield Marshall, a, a railroad porter, and Norma Arika Williams Marshall, a teacher, made him understand how to use the law to fight for what's right. His father took Thurgood and his brother to sit and watch court proceedings so that they could learn about cases. Then they would discuss what they had seen. 
Thurgood later said that his father never told him to become a lawyer, but he turned me into one. He did it by teaching me to argue, by challenging my logic on every point, by making me prove every statement I made. That's some powerful stuff. And, and quite frankly, you know, the legacy that he has left that affects the way I live and affects the way my grandchildren will live. That's pretty powerful. That, it's very that, powerful. And I'm interested that Thurgood Marshall is one of the ones that stands out to, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm not African-American. Thurgood Marshall is to me, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall is, 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 is an icon. He is, He's just so important to all that any of us inspires to be. So what are some of the others that stand out in your mind? Well, I'm gonna speak about some of the women, but I have to mention Frederick Douglass because for people who you know, hear about Frederick Douglass and they learn a paragraph of Black History Month, I don't think they really understand how he went from being enslaved and sold away from his family to becoming one of the most famous men across three continents. Frederick Douglass would grow up to be one of the most famous abolitionists and orators in history, a man who owned a newspaper. We journalists, just like you lawyers, get excited by those. <laughs> and he was going to carry at Tubman. But when Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was nine years old, he was enslaved and he was taken away from his family several times to work at different plantations. He eventually wound up on a plantation in Baltimore, Maryland, where he helped care for the plantation owner's children. And one of the turning points of his life was when the plantation owner's wife began teaching him to read, which was all he ever really wanted to do. So this little boy who was taken away from everything he knew and sold from place to place so he would never know that family again, he became so famous that he once showed up at the White House without an appointment and got to go in. It was 1863, the year President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation to free African-Americans from enslavement. Some formerly enslaved black men joined the Union Army to fight against the Confederate Army. And Frederick went to the White House to complain to the president about how Confederate troops were torturing and killing black soldiers. He made his way through a crowd of white people. They were all waiting to see the president. None of them could go in. He sent his card in and minutes later, the president sent for him. Every time I think about that and I think about the times that I've been to the White House or the times that I needed an interview as a journalist, and it's like, oh my God, I'll never get this. I'll never get this. Yes, I will. And I did. And he did after going through all that he went through. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think it's right that every child not see that progression of, of life and how he became so much more than what would have been expected and from where his beginnings were. So adore him. Rightly so. I'm sensing, uh, I'm, I'm sensing that, that you have a question out there in, 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 in Albion, Holly. Uh, actually, I do. Um, I know that you were working with your grandson as well as another young lady. I was wondering what has been like your favorite moment like working on the book, especially with such young counterparts. Well, I can tell you, I, I'll, I'll tell you about that weekend in a minute, but my favorite thing about this whole process was when the book came out and I, I didn't send it to him, you know, with his name on it. I sent it to his mom and I said, you have to watch him open it. You have to give me his actual reaction. I just need to know because, you know, this is, this is the test. And so she's doing this while she's on the phone and she said, oh, here, this is for you. And she said, he took it out and I could hear him. And he went, oh man. And she <laughs> sat down and, and they're in alphabetical order and read the whole essay on Muhammad Ali standing right there. That was the moment. I'm like, okay, <laughs> kids can read this and kids can like it. But during the, and I think I mentioned this in the pre-interview, but during that weekend where literally, you know, we take pictures and then we take a break, we baked a cake, we made cupcakes, we had lunch, we went to the, we, we kept taking these breaks, but mostly he would want to play Fortnite. But when we finally got done for, for one night, it's like, okay, we're done for tonight. We'll come back tomorrow. She said, let me take his makeup off. And he said, no, no. And he was Thurgood Marshall. We did go to the movies with him as Thurgood Marshall. And I can tell you, it was like that movie with Robin Williams where you know he was a, a young boy that was growing up to be a man too fast. People were looking like, does that boy have gray hair? Is, is <laughs> said anything nobody even asked us but there, but you could tell people were looking and he loved it he's like walking around a little Thurgood Marshall in in his gray hair and glasses 
I wish I was in Dallas because I would take my copy of this book and ask him to inscribe it. Oh, well, I can get that done for you. <laughs> I'm going to have that done. I would love that. Uh, if you have a question for Rochelle, please uh, enter it in the chat session, um, which is easy enough to do. There you'll also see um, her website address where you can learn more about the book and where you can buy the book. Um, I'm looking here at a question that was submitted. I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. It doesn't work very well. It says, have you applied to Michigan's local districts? I assume that means school districts to have that they lived as part of the classroom curriculum. I have not formally done that, but I have begun some conversations with some superintendents and some teachers about doing it. I, I, I think that I have to decide between whether I want somebody to make the book available for lots of kids or whether I want people who love it to do it. Um, the school district in uh, Lawndale, New Jersey bought books for all the kids in this elementary school. That meant the world. And if I could get folks to do that over and over everywhere, I would love it. But um, I'm not opposed to doing both because I do think it, it, it can be something that can really just change a child's life. <clears throat> Excuse me. I guess I'd like to say to the people who are watching too, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, this would be a wonderful exercise to sit and read a chapter or two a night with your child, your grandchild. Um, they can understand it. They can read it themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. But to to be able to read the book with some younger person and then discuss what all this means. I, the book is written for that purpose. It really fits, doesn't it, Rochelle? I, I, that was the goal. I, I think that one of the things that we wanted more than anything was to change the way that kids learn about people who are important and, and that importance is not necessarily based on um, something that's in a current syllabus, but it's some of the people that you know, you might learn about once a year or you might learn about, you know, by happenstance. Even, even someone who, my, my, my whole family, they were all educators. My father was a chemistry professor. My mom was an English teacher. Everybody else in the house and, and, and in our neighborhood, they were teachers. And so they made sure there were things that I knew, but I always felt there's always something I don't know. And the idea that I got to just experience something new all the time was important to me. And that's something I want kids to be able to do, that there's something that you can go, oh, wow, I didn't know that, or oh, this is cool. Um, but I also want adults to have that same, same, you know, sort of experience. Like when I learned that Jackie Robinson had been in a gang and I went, who knew? Who knew? Who knew? And every chapter had, a, I'm a history major. I, most of these names, I looked at the table of contents. I said, oh, yes, I know these people. I know something about, but there were things that I learned because you, you did all of that work to go back and find out that Jackie Robinson was in a gang as a teenager. It's amazing. You wrote in the foreword to the book, um, this book and subsequent books featuring young children from across the nation as scientists, business leaders, sports stars, et cetera, et cetera, will prove that African-Americans have for centuries lived and achieved in various areas. Is there a subsequent book here? Well, I wrote that and Christy read it when she read the galley and she didn't say, wait a minute, I told you we were only doing one book. So <laughs> it is possible, but I can tell you there are people who still deserve to be in a book like this. So if I don't do a whole sequel, I will do a second edition that includes some folks. And one of them, of course, would be Henrietta Lacks, whose story deserves to be known by every person. Um, and, and so who are some of the others, Rochelle? You know, I don't want to be the one to pick. What I want is like the, the whole point of this exercise that we're doing with parents and dressing their kids up is to get a sense of who people think are so vitally important that, you know, they, they need to be a part of the the just sort of the legacy of, of things like this. There are judges like Hiram Revels, you know, who, who was a senator at Reconstruction back when America almost was going in the right path, you know, after enslavement. And, and people just didn't even think about the idea of not becoming this country that they were supposed to be. And then of course you had people who decided, no, we, we're gonna be hateful and we're not gonna do that. But to think that there was a senator in the 1800s who was African-American and what his life was like and what he was about, you know, those types of things. And then there are sports stars, you know, 
uh, quite frankly, I'm a huge fan of Arthur Ashe and, and what he managed to do for tennis. But I also know that there are so many scientists that we don't pay enough attention to. Um, uh, and, and, you know, astronauts and teachers, you know, they're, they're educators who quite frankly deserve to be in the book just because of what they did to change how children learn. So I, I'm hoping that by engaging a lot of different folks that they'll tell me and I'll have a sense of what that is. So it's not just who I would want in the book, but it's who deserves to be in the book, no matter what. And Vanessa did ask a second part of her question. Um, I think it was who inspires me or who do I tend to emulate the most? Yes. Not in this book, but my friend Gwen Eiffel, who was one of the best people I've ever known, I to this day, she was a journalist, a PBS host and Washington Week host and anchor. And just one of the best people, one of the finest journalists in the history of journalism. And every now and again, even now, I will say, hmm, what would Gwen do in certain circumstances? But for the people in this book, if there was somebody that I would emulate is Shirley Chisholm, who literally said she was unbought and unbossed and did things her way. And she was feisty and amazing. And I, I love her as well. It's, it's hard not to tell you the truth. So Holly Ballantyne, you have another question? Um, yes, but I would like to say if you're taking suggestions, I would definitely say do anyone in the member of the Black Panther Party, aside of Fred Hampton, that it's something that I think would be very cool or just like showing that history with children. As, I just think that'd be very cool. <laughs> much for that suggestion. And, and I think that that's one of those things that, again, the record can be corrected because what the Black Panthers did and set out to do was amazing. And yes. if people had looked at the breadth of all that they were doing and not just the little bit that was that became the narrative, yeah. they would see something so different and they would see things in a different way. So thank you for that suggestion. Um, I don't necessarily have a question, but I just want to say thank you for writing this book. Um, I don't know, you know, it's always difficult to know the impact that you have unless someone tells you. And when I first saw the book, I instantly thought of uh, my third grade classroom when I went to Montessori school, one of the books that would be up there that my Black teacher, she would have up there to, uh, to show us Black history. And that really brought me back and just seeing it and hearing about the passion that you have behind it. I just really want to say thank you for it, especially from a Black girl's perspective. It's something that I'm definitely going to order and just have in my repertoire, as well as passing out to family members, especially my eight-year-old brother that also loves Fortnite. That's the only thing that he wants to be on. I don't know why. But just thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. And, and I think that one of the things that it helps to do is to make um, th these different people, you know, if you're just talking about these adults who you don't know anything about how they grew up, it's not the same. But if you read about them and you're a child and you're reading about them as children, all of a sudden it makes them real. It's like, oh, well, I'm that age and that happened to me. Um, the Muhammad Ali story, somebody stole his bike when he was 12 years old. And he said, I'm gonna find whoever did that and I'm gonna whoop him. And you know, the gym, the guy who owned the gym, a former cop, you know, famously told him, well, if you're gonna whoop somebody, you better learn how to fight. And that's when he decided to become a boxer and became, you know, one of the greatest ever. But it, it started with somebody stealing his bike when he was 12 years old. So for kids to see that these moments are real and happen with someone who's their age could make a difference. Absolutely could. Absolutely could. So I'm going to watch for that sequel. I've got to see that sequel. I was thinking here about people, uh, perhaps more recent people. Damon Keith is a name that comes to mind for those of us who live in this area and, and who, like me, are lawyers. Um, he would be a great subject for you. Democracy dies behind closed doors. He was mm -hmm. one of the Democracy dies behind closed doors. He was one of the best. Yeah, absolutely was absolutely was well i'm i'm grateful for this book and i hope there will be another how much of a challenge was it for you I, I know you're a professional journalist and you write so well and you've written for so long but it, it must have been difficult to take someone like dr king or any of these people about whom whole books have been written and to condense that life into something interesting and dynamic in, in what, a thousand words, three or four pages? 
Well, it was even less than a thousand words and that writing for different groups of people at once, I did that as a columnist, that was not so hard. Trying to figure out how to make this book not 9,000 pages, that was the hard job. Um, I, I literally, it took a year of the research because what I would do is order the books and, and buy the books um, instead of just going through, you know, reams and reams of, of digital files. I needed to read all the different things that had been written. And there were very few times that I was totally surprised, but the times that I really, really was surprised, I was knocked off my feet. And trying to get from that childhood moment to where they would become, it was, it was really, really tough. And I had to remember that, okay, this book was not hidden figures. These are figures that people already know, should know, or had heard of. So I didn't have to do the entire, you know, chapter and verse of everything, but I had to find a way to get them from where that moment was to where they would be so that young people could see that same path for themselves. It was, the, that's why it took a year. It was the hardest. It, 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 that was the hardest. A colleague of mine, a classmate of mine from Albion College, whom I mentioned before we started here, who used to work at the paper at which you used to work, uh, used to tell me that he didn't have time to write a short story, but he had time to write a novel. And, <laughs> and, and I think there's, there's a lot of discipline that must have gone into condensing these lives without, um, without leaving out too much, but not putting too much in. I have another question, uh, this one from a, a friend of mine in Albion. Did you find writing for a young audience easier or more difficult than writing for the Detroit Free Press readers? I think you've kind of covered that, but the question is worth repeating. Well, I, I don't mind talking a little bit more about that because th this was what was interesting. Um, I, I love the people who read my column, even the few folks who did not necessarily like the column but kept reading it. And I always wondered, if, if you don't like some of the things I'm writing, why are you reading <laughs> And I had one guy said, well, you're good. I just don't always agree with you. And one guy who said, I'm waiting for the day that you're going to write something that I agree with. But for the most part, it was an amazing relationship between people I respected and people who respected me. The difference for this is that I would not know anything about how people felt until the book was done. And that part was hard, which is why it was so important for me uh, that Caleb liked the book, that young people liked the book. Uh, that, that 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 instant gratification, you, re, you write a column, it's in the paper the next day, you either get lots of calls saying, oh my God, that's great, it's the best thing you've ever written, or, oh, I didn't like that. This, it, it was just months of, okay, we're waiting for the galley, we're waiting for the, you know, printing, we're waiting for it to hit the stores, it's now in the stores, and then you hear something. That that part was hard, so, but, but writing, um, Writing was easy for me both times because it's what I live for and it's what I do. Um, the hard part was the editing and the revising and the making sure it was perfect. And that was just like writing my column. I, I would write a column and revise it, I don't know, 17 times. So in each of these, I might start with a chapter that was, I don't know, 50 pages and then it needed to be 20 and then it needed to be 10 and then it needed to be five. It was a lot. <laughs> Uh, if, yeah, I've written a fair amount myself, but I understand the challenge. I'm not nearly as good as you are at it, but it's it's so difficult, the editing. Um, and, and yet when you get all done, it reads with such facility, with such flow. It's so easy. My goodness. Little do people realize. Um, the book is That They Lived, American African-Americans Who Changed the World by Rochelle Riley and Christy Smith-Jones, who started the whole idea with these lovely pictures of little Lola, her daughter, that caught Rochelle's eye. Uh, this, there are 20 stories, 20 chapters, 21 people, because one of them is about two. Um, and, and they're just, they're wonderful stories. And, and I wondered, I wondered at first how you decided the order in which they'd be presented until it dawned on me that you'd done it alphabetically. That was the easiest thing. <laughs> it took me a while to do, for that to, for me to figure that out. You're welcome to submit questions um, uh, uh, on the chat function. Um, I, I, will, I will relay one of those questions now, if I may, Rochelle. The question is, had you ever interviewed any of the people who, would, uh, who wound up in the book? And if so, uh, how did you impart that information to the book? How did it find its way to the book? 
Well, I actually interviewed uh, Senator Barack Obama when, when he was running for president and then President Barack Obama in the Roosevelt Room at the White House, which is one of the highlights of my life. Yeah. Uh, but neither of those things uh, actually, it's not that they didn't make it into the book, it's that, for instance, the question I asked him that became the front page story that somebody else got to write was, um, what makes you lose sleep at night while you're trying to you know, win this race? Uh, and then the question I asked in the Roosevelt room was, um, do, do you have to do your job every day thinking about the fact that you're the first African-American to do this? And he gave this wonderful answer about how uh, he felt like Jackie Robinson and quoted Jackie Robinson, who said, I don't think about any of that now. I can think about that when you know my career is over right now. All I think about is winning and losing. So he said, right now, all I'm thinking about is governing. And when it's all over, I can look back and see what that history looks like. And I thought about that while I was writing because he and Jackie Robinson are in the book, but I didn't use anything from the interview. You said you'd covered uh, Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. in uh, back in Kentucky, Louisville. It, had you interviewed him as well? Oh my gosh, we talked all the time. Well, here was the thing. So I did not know Muhammad Ali, but my very first column for the Detroit, I mean, for the Louisville Courier Journal, chastised the entire city for there not being something there to honor Muhammad Ali, who was the most famous person in the world famous person to ever come out of Louisville and we should be ashamed of ourselves and we should do something and it's because his family and his wife you know this amazing Lani Ali had been trying to get a museum in his honor in his hometown and had been having difficulty doing it so I wrote this piece and I included the names of almost every rich person in town that I'd ever heard of so my editor got the column and said um, I, I'm reading the piece where you're calling for this museum from Muhammad Ali and it's got all of these people in it. Do you know these people? And I said, no, but everybody knows that they're rich. And he left the names in. <laughs> the next morning, the <laughs> mayor of Louisville, Jerry Abramson, who was at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, had read, read the column and he said, okay, you're right. This is ridiculous. We're going to do something about this. We need to get this museum done. So I got to write a front page story about the mayor having read the column said we're going to get this done and so that sort of reinvigorated that fight that they had been carrying on for years to get this museum done and the Muhammad Ali Center opened on the banks of the Ohio in 2005. I went back for the opening I was in Detroit at that time, but I went back and then the family also invited me to come out for the premiere of Ali in Los Angeles and I went out so that I could you know watch the film and hang out. But I said, well, if I'm going, you know, I'll make the paper pay for it and I'll write about it. I was the only reporter in this in this whole ballroom. And all I remember is I, I just thought that Kevin James was the funniest person in the world. And he and I spent a lot of the evening just sitting there talking to each other. Um, but it, it, it was one of those things that I was honored to have been around and to be in a space where I could write about what he meant and what he did. And I wound up doing this three-part series called Coming Home. And it was about you know him coming back to Louisville after having that whole career and what he does now. I got to visit his uh, farm in Darien Springs before Ed Bradley did from, from 60 Minutes. And uh, a photographer went with me and took pictures of him at prayer in the morning. And we hung out for a few days. And he was always the funniest person in the world. I, I remember going from the kitchen to the den where we were doing interviews. I think I just went to get a glass of water. And as I was going past the laundry room, he scared me. He was a practical joker. He jumped out and did this thing that he could do with his fingers. It was like a cricket. And I almost jumped six feet. And Lonnie said, stop doing that, Muhammad. And I thought, this man is just this hilarious guy who, um, was everything that you want someone to be when they believe in who they are. And if changing his name and choosing his religion was something that was important to him and he was willing to do everything to, to hold true to that, that's the most amazing thing you could do. So I, I got to spend time with him. I'll never forget when we, and this was when you know going online and doing things on social media was a big deal. And we had this afternoon session where people could ask him questions online. And so Lonnie was on one side of him and I was on the other and somebody would ask a question and we'd read it and he'd you know, give us an answer and somebody would type it in. So there was like a whole chat. And so at one point I asked the question and he didn't like the way I asked it. He said, who do you think you are, Howard Cosell? And it was just as clear as a bell. I said, okay, let me just sit back and not do anything else because that's the best thing that's ever happened in life. 
Um, but no, it, it was it was amazing times, and um, I was so glad to get to know him. You've had such an amazing and interesting career. I, I could talk to you forever. Do you have another question out there uh, in Albion? Uh, yes, it's actually a question about like the layout and the aesthetic of the book. Why did you make it the way that it is? Because it is a fairly bigger book. It's not like, you know, a chapter book or a story story book. I won't call it a story book, but it is fairly large. I am so glad. Holly, you are so astute. I am so glad you called that because here's the thing. Remember, I'm writing for nine to 90. I said it cannot be a children's book and it cannot be an adult book. So it has to be in between. So all I told them was that it needed to be square. And this is what they came up with. And if it had been too big, adults wouldn't have read it. If it had been too little, the kids wouldn't have read it. So it was right in between. It, it was a calculated guess on my part. And I appreciate your pointing it out because uh, I love the way the book looks that way. And, um, and it's one of my favorite covers because every time I look at those faces, they're easily recognizable. You know who they are and um, you, you want them to be everything that those people that they are, you know, embodying to be. You want them to see that whatever it is that they want in the world, that they can have it. That's, that, that's a great question, by the way. Um, really thank you for that. I love that. I hadn't thought to ask it. Uh, and, and the interesting part, if you, if you, when, you, when you look at the book, not if, but when, um, each chapter begins with a picture of either Caleb or Lola yes. dressed as the person who's the subject of that chapter. And then opposite it is a picture of that person. Here's an example. Uh, uh -huh. that, and and it, it's these kids, I don't know how they, I don't know how you coach them, how you help them so well capture the spirit the, of, of the people that they were uh, they were depicting. Well, you know, kids are sponges and they're smart. And if you actually talk to them like they're smart, like the Duke Ellington picture that I love that I yeah. mentioned before, um, when you talk about somebody that can't read or write any music, but they love music so much that when they sit down at the piano, they're just glowing. You understand what that means. I mean, you get that. Of course, you don't know until you see your grandson sit down and actually do it that, yes, he actually got it. But it's just like, um, you know, if, if he plays football and basketball, and if I said, okay, I want you to be Patrick Mahomes, you know, and Kansas City just came back and they didn't actually lose that game that they shouldn't have lost. And you're just really excited. And, you know, they, they know what that looks like and feels like. And if you give them a chance, they, they soak it right up. Well, it was amazing. They're, they're truly amazing. The pictures alone are worth the book. I think they're wonderful. And of course, that's all how it started, right? With you seeing pictures of Lola on social media, and you had to know who this little girl is. That's right. That's right. right. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. If anyone has um, uh, other questions, please pass them on in the chat function. Uh, I have one that's a little off base here, but you mentioned in the foreword what you called your one woman what America, One History campaign. Can you tell me a few words about that? About 15 years ago at an NABJ, a, 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 it's a National Association of Black Journalists annual convention. We've got 4,000 journalists who come and we do training and we do um, workshops and we sort of reinvigorate each other to go back to our newsrooms and, and cover the world. But I just stood up and announced one day that I was going to start this campaign called One America, One History. So we would stop teaching a uh, history that excluded black people. And then we try to make up for it every February, you know, by teaching a few posters. That if we did that, it would change the way that we um, interacted with each other, change the way we see each other and change the way that children would grow up. And, um, I, I still, I work at that and I do that. There's not an official campaign because of course I had a full-time job and I don't know what I was thinking. Now I have a full-time job to do that. But, but in every way possible, when I find ways to do that, that's what I do. And that's what both of these books are about. And that's what I'll continue to be doing um, to make sure that we are not, um, we cannot continue to teach a false narrative 
uh, about what America is and how America was founded and what has happened. You know, there's nothing worse than, than watching children being miseducated. Uh, there's a civil rights movement, but we're not going to tell you why there was one. Martin Luther King was a great man, but we're not going to tell you why he was mad. Um, it, it's okay. It's okay to look at our whole history because so much of it is not, you know, sort of buried in some of those beginnings that are ugly. But just because they were ugly doesn't mean we should try to hide them. And all of the accomplishments of, of, of you know, different African Americans, just imagine what it would have been like if kids had learned all of those things for centuries then you wouldn't have people, anybody, sort of growing up to believe that they're automatically better than someone else because they don't know all of that accomplishment and all of that progress and all of that perseverance that uh, happened in spite of. Well, I, I can't, I, I, this could go on forever. I, I found each of the stories in the book to be inspirational. In one way or another, each of the subject was aspirational. Um, and I would encourage people to get the book, to sit down with their children, their grandchildren. And if you don't have children, just read it like I did. You'll, you'll really enjoy it. And I think you'll learn from it. Holly, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You're awesome, Holly. Thank you. Thank Holly you. is a student at Albion College, uh, a sophomore. Uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, and and uh, you brought some you brought some real substance to this. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you so much. We need to get Mike. We need to get Rochelle back to talk about some of her other work. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Mike Montgomery is our producer. Uh, this American Democracy series goes on about on a kind of a monthly schedule. I'm going to move a laptop over here so I can tell you about what's coming up. Um, our next program will be about a month from now. It's Wednesday, March 16 at 7, 7 p.m. We'll visit with journalist Andrew Lapin uh, about his podcast, which is Radioactive, The Father Coughlin Story. And we'll speak with him about the infamous radio priest who quickly rose to national prominence and some influence from his base at the Shrine of a Little Flower, the parish in Royal Oak on Woodward Avenue. It's there today. And he just as quickly fell from the true nature and broader implications of, of Paulo as his, those implications became more clear. Uh, these podcasts are wonderful. I'm so eager to talk to Andrew Lapin about them. On Wednesday, April 20, we'll finish our spring season visiting with an old friend, A.J. Bame, uh, about his new book called White Lies, The Double Life of Walter F. White, and America's Darkest Secret uh, program you'll enjoy. Uh, for more information about these two programs and the rest of the American Democracy series, look at www.warmemorial.org. And while you're writing down websites, look at rochellereilly.com, our, our guest's website, uh, much there to learn. And you can learn more about the book we've been talking about tonight. And I. I often say I've read and I recommend, I really enjoyed this book, Rochelle. Thank you so much. It kind of made me feel young again, <laughs> you know? And, and I wish that when I was Caleb's age, someone had given me a book like this to read. It will have a, it will have a place on my bookshelf and I'm going to take you up in your offer to have young Caleb uh, ins inscribe my book. Glad to do it. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Eddie Visco, for arranging to have Holly Ballantyne here from St. Louis, Missouri and Albion College. Uh, you're going to go far in this world, young lady. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all. And we'll see you in March and again in April for our American Democracy Series. Good night, everyone.